Hi everybody! In this week's project, I'm going to show you how I built this Wi-Fi weather display. It uses some NeoPixel LEDs to illuminate an abstract design that changes with the weather, and a numerical display to show today's high temperature. The circuit uses an Arduino-compatible ESP8266 Wi-Fi controller, the Adafruit Feather Huzzah, and its companion Featherwing 7 segment display. The code for this project is a simple mashup of Arduino library example sketches, and I've included it in the tutorial linked below. Weather data is piped from If This Then That, an API gateway with customizable triggers for just about anything you can think of. The condition and weather data are tracked in two feeds on the cloud data service Adafruit.io, which are continually checked by the Arduino program. To enclose the circuit, I used a simple shadow box. A piece of white paper makes a perfect diffuser for the front, and uh, I like the way the seven segment display looks behind the paper, and the shadow box gives the NeoPixels some much needed space to diffuse. I experimented with different weather condition displays, but settled on this triangular design with one each for sun, clouds, and precipitation. I just used pieces of cardboard to block off the three areas. To create a margin for the display away from the corner, I used a permaproto board, which also comes in handy for attaching the NeoPixel power, ground, and signal wires. The tip I always give about soldering wires to these strips is to alternate sides. That way your potentially messy solder connections have a bit more elbow room. I'm powering the device directly from its USB connection, so I cut a hole in the back of the shadow box and the frame to accommodate for the cable, but you could also use a battery for this project. And that's pretty much it. Check out the tutorial link below. Thanks so much for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for new videos every week. Next up in my mini series of Shadowbox IoT projects is a YouTube subscriber counter. I was inspired by the play button awards YouTube sends out for subscriber milestones and whipped up a simple circuit using an ESP8266 Wi-Fi board and a seven segment display. This is a great beginner level project with just a little soldering and code personalization required to make it work for your own account. I created a two part template for the shadow box which you can download at the tutorial linked below. The graphic goes right behind the glass, and the other part is for easy placement of the circuit. I used an Adafruit Feather Huzzah ESP8266 board for this project, to which I soldered female header pins so that I could plug in the Featherwing 7 segment display. Tidy package, no extra wiring required. The code is based on the sample sketch from the Arduino YouTube API library I found on GitHub and I mashed it up with the seven segment display sample code to display my current subscriber count. Honestly, the hardest part of this project was creating a Google API key, which took maybe 10 minutes. As you may have noticed, this display only works to show subscriber counts under 10,000. It's not a lot more complicated to add more digits and I'll be happy to make a revised version to celebrate that milestone. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing. See you next time. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna learn how to make some adorable hair scrunchies while learning some basic crafting techniques that every girl should know. Are they gone? Okay, good. These days, holding back your seething rage can be tough, but you just need a few supplies to craft your own fashion accessories that will go great with all kinds of institutional oppression. Find a piece of fabric to use for your hair scrunchie. I'm going with a polyester satin and silk because the smooth surface reduces microaggressions, which can lead to breakage. Gently iron out any internalized misogyny, cause that can really come back to bite you later. Cut a piece of thin elastic to match the circumference of your wrist. Cut out a rectangle of fabric about three and a half inches by 14 inches, or two to three times longer than your elastic. The obvious choice is to use scissors, but you could also use a rotary cutter to infuse some defense for the inevitable lateral aggression you'll receive for wearing the final piece. Just be sure to protect your work surface because the residue could affect the sandwiches you're gonna make later. You'll need one safety pin and a handful of very not safety pins. Fold the fabric in half lengthwise with the right side facing itself and use the pins to secure the raw edge. 
use the sewing machine you paid for yourself to stitch the raw edges together, leaving a few inches open at each end. If you've got extra needles for the machine, sewing over the pins is an acceptable risk. But if you struggle with anxiety, take the pins out as you sew. Attach a safety pin to one end and use it to thread the tube into itself until it's essentially folded in half. Line up the short ends of the rectangle and pin and sew a seam. Pull out a few of the previous stitches if you need some more space. Pull on the inner portion to reveal the right side of the fabric and bury your feelings inside using the safety pin again. Attach the elastic to itself either with the sewing machine or by hand. To close up the remaining seam, fold pin and either machine top stitch or invisible stitch it shut. It's also called the ladder stitch because of the way you stitch straight across and up to the next rung. Keep climbing until you break through the glass ceiling and the college professors you respect stop following you on Twitter. It's the hardest part of this project actually. After you've made a few scrunchies, a great next project is pajama pants or scrunchies with legs. Can you believe it's controversial to put a bunched up piece of fabric in your hair? I'd like to think that this look says girls just want to have fundamental rights, but apparently its lack of sophistication stirs up raw and intense emotion normally reserved for crushing the patriarchy or stress eating. You better call Becky with the Completely practically though, I need these scrunchies because I have really fine hair that breaks easily, especially when I'm thrashing around in my sleep. Hello everyone, welcome to a new series about creating a new seat for my motorcycle. Over the next few installments, I'll show you how I'm cleaning up an old seat and uh, reshaping it and recovering it. I bought a seat on eBay because the one that's on my bike is in perfectly good shape and who knows, maybe I wanna put it back later. If I decide to, I could sell my current seat for more money because it's in better condition. Anyway, the general idea is to take this old seat, uh, remove the vinyl cover that's aged and brittle, remove the rust from the pan, shape the foam, put it all back together and create a new vinyl upholstered cover for the seat. The main reason I wanna put a new seat on my bike is to lower the standover height because I'm still kinda of on my tiptoes, which is no good when the ground is icy or slippery and um, I really could use like just Anything, an extra half inch would be awesome. The seat came to me pretty rusty and uh, when I went to take it apart, I had to bend back these rusty metal tabs before I could pry the plastic chromed edge trim off of the edge of the seat. Gnarly, earwigs. I thought initially I could clean up the rust from the pan like with my flex shaft or a wire brush, but when I finally got the foam separated from the pan, I saw that the pan was a lot rustier on the side where the foam was, which makes sense. That's the side where the water, big sponge, gets held against it. But I was gonna have to soak the rust off. So I went to the hardware store looking for a can of spray adhesive I'd need. I knew they would have that. And then maybe a plastic bin that was like big enough for the seat, a pan to soak in. They didn't have something like that. So I got a plastic drop cloth to line the uh, box that the seat came in. And I was just gonna be really careful that I didn't like puncture the plastic drop cloth uh, when I was soaking it. So I did a little research online and sure there are some pretty harsh chemicals you could get at the big box store to remove rust quickly. Uh, but I also read that you could use apple cider vinegar. And this got me really excited because not only is it low VOC, so there's not gonna be a lot of fumes or like problems putting it down the drain, but I happen to have a lot of extra apple cider vinegar left over from when I tried to make hard cider but didn't sterilize the bucket enough. Luckily I didn't come out with five gallons of mold, but rather five gallons of very fancy apple cider vinegar that I've been hoarding in the fridge for months. This is the perfect excuse to use it all up. The mild acid in the apple cider vinegar is gonna react with the rust and like pull it away and loosen it so that we can just wipe it off and clean up the rest of the seat. The only downside I've heard anyway, cause I've never tried it, is that it takes a lot of time. But I have time, but I don't have time for like nasty fumes in my house. Okay, so the pan has been soaking in the apple cider vinegar water mixture for a little under two days now. And I wanna take it out and check and see how it's doing. Only smells like salad dressing in the house when I open the lid. The solution has a lot of debris in it, which I look at as a good sign.
That's metal. Right there. That's bare metal. Amazing. Wow, look at... So it really just, it turns it into some kind of sludge. Cause look at that. I'm like, that black might be paint, but that's bare metal. Oh, super cool. In scrubbing off this outer layer of rust, I think it'll expose more of the under layer of rust and then make the reaction happen even faster. Okay, there's a certain ratio of time to elbow grease involved here and since I would rather use more of the former and less of the latter. I'm gonna put it back in the liquid now. Good night, my precious. So next time I'll show you how I'm shaping the upholstery foam and cleaning up the rest of the rust and painting the seat pan. And then in future installments, I'll show you how I'm creating a paper pattern for the new vinyl seat cover that I'm gonna sew. I have this marine grade vinyl that I got online and um, it's a bit tricky to work with and I got some like bigger needles for my sewing machine. So I think in the middle I might do an intermediary project out of this stuff just to get the hang for sewing like curved seams and stuff like that before I commit to the larger project. So thanks so much for watching. I'll hope you subscribe to catch the future installments and I'll see you next time.
Welcome back to my series of videos about restoring and customizing a seat for my vintage motorcycle. In this, the second episode of the series, I'll show you how I removed the rust from the original seat pan and then painted it with automotive epoxy primer. I'll put a link to the first episode in the series where I took the seat apart if you haven't caught that already, and uh, don't forget to subscribe to be notified of the next one. As I mentioned earlier, the apple cider vinegar I was using to remove the rust on the pan takes some time to get working and that was fine by me because I was going on vacation. So I grabbed, oddly enough, a, a space bag, you know, those vacuum storage bags. And uh, since the seat pan was kind of sharp, I wrapped it in a t-shirt before pouring the whole apple cider vinegar water mixture into the bag. This got me greater surface coverage since this whole box rig I was using was still letting some of the metal peek out above the surface and I really needed all surfaces of the seat pan to be clean. All told, I think it was in there for about two weeks. The apple cider vinegar kind of turns the rust into sludge after which you can brush it with a wire brush and wipe it away with paper towels. Next up, I headed to the shop because I just could not get these mounting screws for the upholstery strap to come off of the sides of this seat pan. So I ended up using an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel to just cut them off. Next up, it's time to prep it for painting. And so I really tried to get as much of the rust off as I could, and then I cleaned and dried the seat pan. If I had access to one, I would have used a sandblaster to really get into all of the nooks and crannies. But for the investment I'm putting into this, I think that this is going to last a long time, even if I didn't get every single bit of the rust, because the epoxy primer is going to inhibit the rust development quite substantially. So if it lasted 40 years and it looks like this, then I think I can probably get at least another 20 out of it, right? That's my thinking anyway. This next painting process is pretty toxic. I went from a low VOC apple cider vinegar situation to a really high VOC automotive paint situation really quick, but I've changed environments completely. At the garage, I am working um, in a well-ventilated area with my respirator on, also goggles, gloves, long sleeves, and a bandana to protect my hair. I'll put a link to where I got the epoxy primer in the description, uh, but I, it's not new. It's kind of an old can that I used to paint my boyfriend's tank last summer, and so it was kind of sludgy and ended up clogging the tube a bit, but I did have a really great experience with it when I used it the first time when the can was fresh. I just followed the instructions on the can, so I mixed it uh, four parts to one part of the hardener, and then I put it in one of these Prevail sprayer things. You can uh, put the paint and the hardener in the bottom reservoir and then uh, shake it all up and then put on the can of accelerant and it'll uh, flush it through and spray it onto the seat. I sprayed on two coats about 10 or 15 minutes apart and uh, then I had some clogging problems with my nozzle because my primer's not new and just touched up some areas with a foam brush. Then I let it dry for 24 hours so it wasn't making any more fumes and the epoxy primer is completely dry. Next up, it was time to reattach the hardware I had removed earlier. That includes the latch for the seat and a couple of other rubber and plastic bits. And this thing is all set for foam. That was a lot for one episode, so I'm saving the foam shaping for its own episode. That'll be next. And after that, I'll sew and attach a new vinyl cover. I also already published a practice project with this vinyl, and it's been performing really well in my home sewing machine, which I'm pretty excited about. So catch that video in Instructable if you haven't already. And uh, please subscribe to catch the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Welcome back to my motorcycle seat rebuild series. In this, the third episode, I'll show you how I shaped the upholstery foam that came inside my vintage eBay buy. I'll put links to the first two episodes where I take the seat apart and restore the metal seat pan. Don't forget to subscribe to catch the next one about sewing a new vinyl seat cover. My main goal here was to lower the standover height of my bike just slightly without sacrificing too much comfort. My seat foam is mostly intact except for some moldy parts I'm choosing to ignore. We'll fill in these cutouts around the strap fasteners later. The first step is to mark some guidelines on the foam using a ruler and a marker. I marked one line for my first cut and another for the beginning of the rounded edge. I made straight rough cuts with a serrated bread knife, though I've seen folks get great results with electric turkey cutters, just be careful. I'm saving the bigger slices for filling in the gaps. I got one of those foam razors online and 
used it to even out the rough surfaces and shave down the foam more precisely. Since I'm new at this, I did a lot of the work with this tool because it didn't take off too much material at once, so I could assess my progress easily and frequently. You can always take off more foam, but it's harder to put it back if you made a mistake. I didn't try too hard to get the rusty bits from the underside, but I did a little cleanup with a wire brush. The underside of my foam was molded to the shape of the seat pan, so I didn't want to compromise that shape too much, and the epoxy primer on the seat pan should keep all that rust out. To join the foam and the seat pan, I used Super 77 spray adhesive. I filled in the gaps where the strap fasteners were with some small pieces of foam cut from the leftover slices. That's it for this time. Thanks so much for watching. Next time we'll draft a pattern and sew a new vinyl cover for the seat and then attach it to the bike. Check out my motorcycle pin board, catch the previous episodes, and subscribe to catch future updates in the series. Welcome back to my motorcycle seat rebuild series. In this last installment, I'll show you how I sewed a new vinyl cover for my vintage seat. I'll put links up for you to the other videos in this series where I take the seat apart and clean up the pan and foam, as well as to the project write-up on Instructables that goes through every detail. My technique in pattern making and sewing this cover are largely based on a video I found by Sailrite, which is also the vendor from which I ordered most of the supplies for this part of the project, which includes some waterproof upholstery vinyl, fabric-backed foam, and UV-resistant upholstery thread. Before attempting such a large project with these new materials, I made this pencil case as a test, which gave me the confidence that my home sewing machine could tackle this seat cover. I made a sketch and drafted a pattern by tracing the shape of the seat onto some gridded paper. I even used the old cover as a guide for drafting the piece that wraps around the back and sides of the seat. The basic idea is you spray glue the back of the vinyl to the foam side of the fabric back foam then stitch channels to create that lobed effect before joining all the pattern pieces together. I used a washable tailor's chalk to mark the parallel lines onto the vinyl. If your sewing machine works well, sewing with the vinyl side on the bottom, you can just use a plain marker to draw the lines on the foam. I sewed the complete cover and thought it came out just okay. While my sewing machine was technically capable of stitching these materials, I wasn't getting the most consistent feed rates or thread tension, and since I have access to the lab where I teach at SVA, I headed there to whip up version 2 on their industrial Juki. I used small binder clips instead of pins to hold the pattern pieces together before stitching, and also to the pan while fitting. I used a heat gun to soften the vinyl ever so slightly when it came time to fold at a seam or wrap tightly around the pan. I ordered this reproduction chrome plastic trim online and it works by pinching the upholstery to the metal seat pan while the metal clips on the inside of the pan grip into its groove. Swapping the original seat out for the new one was just a matter of two metal pivot pins, each with a washer and cotter pin. Overall, I'm pretty pleased with my new motorcycle seat, and I had a lot of fun working on it. After riding with it for a bit, both as a driver and a passenger, I can say it's just as comfortable as the original, and helps get my short legs a little closer to the ground. It is forming creases where the material scrunches when I sit on it, so next time I might slope the foam a little differently, or change the pattern to have a seam along the compound curve, or maybe just use a thicker material. Thanks for coming on this seat restoration journey with me. I hope you'll subscribe to see more DIY projects and videos about crafts, technology, and my life here in New York City. See ya.
here's how to create an easy beaded wrap bracelet. Find the complete step-by-step -step tutorial on Instructables. You're welcome to substitute the materials you have, but for this bracelet, I'm using Amazonite stone beads in six millimeter round, round leather cord and silk beading cord. Cut a piece of leather cord about 30 inches long and fold it in half. At the midpoint, tie an overhand knot and create a small loop and two tails. Secure the loop to your work surface with tape or use a clipboard. Cut a piece of beading cord about the same length as the leather cord and thread it through the eye of a beading needle. Tie the other end of your beading cord around the left leather cord with a square knot and leave a tail about four inches long. Thread your needle through a bead, then slide the bead all the way to the knotted tail of the beading cord. Then thread the needle underneath the right leather cord and pull the cord to the right while keeping the bead between the two leather cords. Next, reverse the direction of the needle and thread it through the bead again, this time above the right leather cord and then underneath the left cord. Pull the beading cord all the way through until the bead is snugly secured between the two leather cords. The rest of the beads go on just like the first. Snug the beads up close to one another and adjust the cord loops as needed to pull tight. You're essentially creating a figure eight pattern with your needle around the two leather cords, capturing a bead in the process. Continue adding beads until the bracelet reaches your desired length. It's smart to try to keep your beading cord tight as you go, but don't worry if things are looking a little loose. You can snug up your beading cord by using your needle to catch each loop and pull the string tight, starting at the earlier beads and working your way down. To secure the tail of beading cord, thread it around the leather cord in a figure eight pattern, but without any beads this time. Pull it tight while keeping the leather cord symmetrical then thread the needle through the newly created triangle shape opening to cinch down the figure eights. Tie all three tails together in an overhand knot near the last bead and trim the tail of the beading cord only. Then tie a second knot or add a button if you wish with the leather cords a short distance from the first knot. This design looks great as a single wrap or make it extra long and wrap it around your wrist twice or three times. It's easy to make this bracelet your own through choice of materials. Try layering a few of them together and varying the number of wraps. This project is an excerpt from my free Instructables jewelry class, so if you liked it, be sure to check out the other new skills you can learn at the link in the description. Thanks so much for watching, and subscribe for more videos each week about DIY tech, crafts, and my life in New York City.
These wire-wrapped and beaded earrings are a great first project to make with wire. Find the complete step-by-step -step tutorial with links to all the supplies on Instructables. For each earring, you'll need a 4-inch piece of 18-gauge wire, about an arm's length of smaller gauge wrapping wire, 7 beads, 3 jump rings, and 1 ear wire. After putting on your safety glasses, use a pair of flat nose pliers to gently straighten a section of your heavier wire from the spool. Line up the straight wire with a small ruler and use your flush snips to cut two 4-inch pieces. The length of these wires determines the overall size of the earrings, so feel free to experiment, but make sure the two wires match. Pick up your round nose pliers and grasp the wire firmly as close to its end as possible. Wrap the wire around tightly to form a loop. Repeat to form a loop at the other ends of the wires, being sure to keep the loops aligned to the same plane. You can optionally use a chasing hammer and bench block to flatten the loops. Watch your fingers and give the wire loop six or seven good thwacks with the hammer. Then flip it over and strike it a few more times so that it looks evenly flattened on both sides. This has an obvious visual effect on the shape of the metal, but it also has a strengthening effect. Hammering work hardens the metal, making it stiffer, and also the new profile in the loop is uh, like a tiny I-beam, which is stronger than the previously round wire profile. Use pliers and your fingers to shape the wires into teardrop shapes. String seven beads onto that arm's length of thinner wrapping wire and kink one end to prevent the beads from falling off. Lay the unkinked wire end across the teardrop shape and wrap it five or six times with the help of some pliers. I like to wrap clockwise, but it doesn't matter which way so long as you stick with one direction throughout the project. Slide one bead down the wire until it reaches the larger loop. Hold the bead in place with one hand and wrap around the larger wire twice. Bring another bead into position and repeat the wrapping process to fill the shape with beads. As you go, try to keep your bead spacing even and your wires snug. Wrap the remaining wire five or six times around before trimming the tail short and pinching it flush. To complete these earrings, we'll use jump rings to attach the ear wires. To open a split jump ring, grasp the two wire ends using two hands and two sets of pliers. Twist your wrists in opposite directions to twist the wire ends apart laterally. After opening the jump ring, loop one end of your wire masterpiece onto the jump ring and close it the same way you opened it. Grasp both ends and twist towards each other until they are aligned. Open a third jump ring and use it to hook both of the previous jump rings as well as an ear wire and then carefully use two pairs of pliers to close the last jump ring. Repeat the steps to bead and complete a second teardrop shape for a pair of finished earrings and then whip up a few more pairs to give as gifts while you've got your tools out. Try switching up the colors of wire or beads or the size of the wire loop and the number of beads or even align the beads to the outside of the wire loop for a different look. This project is an excerpt from my free Instructables jewelry class, so if you liked it, be sure to check out the other new skills you can learn at the link in the description. I've always used sketchbooks and notebooks to organize my thoughts, to do items, sketches, and doodles, but only recently learned of the bullet journal symbology which is an optimized way of storing and making your notes, created by writer Carol. Bullet journalists are a community of productivity and organization fiends who use a common language to describe and share their planners. I've been organizing my notes in bullet journal form since the beginning of March, and for me it's been all about the daily log. This is what sits open on my desk all week, helping me keep track of everyday to-dos, meetings, events, and it's pretty similar to the way I've historically kept my notebook in the past, but with so much more color and flair thanks to online inspiration and a fetish for art supplies. Doodle pages are where I blow off some steam. At the start of each month, a lot of YouTubers I've been watching do a monthly spread, so I've been trying it out, but I'm not sure how useful it is for me personally. I do plenty of drawing throughout, so 
It's not my only chance to get creative, but this month I sort of combined the month into a doodle page. Another popular thing to try is a little at-home data viz by tracking your daily habits and activities. I've been refining the list of things that I track, but I generally fall off from marking later on each month. I see a connection between artful bullet journaling and scrapbooking, especially when it comes to stickers. An index at the start of the bullet journal helps you find important pages, now and forever. My maker's notebook has page numbers and a page up front for indexing the contents. Dedicated spreads and sketches will vary based on your interests. So for me, that's keeping track of project brainstorm lists, sketching out ideas, and keeping notes related to individual tasks or events. I've been picking a limited color scheme of markers to use each month and binging on YouTube videos about color blending and hand lettering. I've made a full write-up about my favorite supplies on Instructables. Find the link in the description. It also has links to some creators who've inspired my journey so far. My journal motivates me to keep track of my tasks and goals because it's fun to draw and I'm a visual person. Everybody's notebook is gonna look different. I use a large graphical style that really helps me navigate between my everyday to-do list and current project sketches easily. I love the community and online inspiration aspect of bullet journaling too. I'm curious how y'all organize your creative and administrative tasks and would love to hear about it in the comments. Thanks so much for watching and subscribe for more DIY videos every week. When cherries go on sale, I always whip up at least one batch of brandied cocktail cherries. The recipe is super simple. Hot water, sugar, pitted cherries, and brandy. You can pit your cherries however you like. I use a regular vegetable peeler, but you could also try that chopstick over a bottle technique if that works for you. Put them in a jar and then fill the jar about halfway up with very hot sugar water. You could also give them a toss on the stove in a saucepan, but it makes a dish. Fill the jar the rest of the way up with brandy and stick it in the fridge, at least overnight. Okay, so here's what happened. I made one drink, a ginger whiskey sour, and then when I was putting the jar away, I slipped and I dropped it on the kitchen floor. It shattered, it broken glass everywhere, the whole batch ruined, and the sticky floor for days. After sulking and cleaning, I made another batch with the few remaining cherries I had left in the fridge. These cherries will keep in the fridge for several weeks and they only get better as they soak up the alcohol sugar mixture. And besides cocktail garnishes, they make great ice cream topping along with the liquid from the jar. You could try mixing up this recipe by adding some whole spices to the mix or a splash of your favorite liqueur. I'd love to hear how you make it your own. Cheers to all my subscribers, old and new, and thanks so much for watching. I publish new DIY projects every week about crafts, technology, and my life here in New York City. Welcome back. This week, I'm making embroidered patches to memorialize my late cat, Beatrice. You could use this technique to create an embroidered patch from any image really. I'm just gonna walk you through the things that I did, but there's a bunch of different tools that you could use instead for each step basically. I started in Photoshop, I cropped down the photo I wanted to use and put it in grayscale. And then I increased the contrast and played with the levels so that the whites were very light and the blacks were very dark. That way I'm gonna bring out all of the detail when I simplify the image. Then I'll go to Image Adjustments Posterize, and this is going to reduce the number of colors in the image, and it corresponds with the number of colors of floss you want to use in your embroidery. And for me, that's four, plus an accent color for my pretty kitty's eyes. Then I went to print it at different sizes on a piece of paper because I wasn't sure exactly what size I wanted it to be, and I found that if I reduce the opacity of the image, uh, it was easier for me to trace it later. Then I used a small tip micron pen to trace the different regions uh, so that I could see them better when I put it on top of my light mat. This thing is super awesome, by the way. Then I chose a light colored fabric to place on top of the drawing and used my water soluble marking pen to trace the drawing again onto the fabric. 
The ink from this pen will disappear later when I spritz the whole thing with water. Then I put the fabric in an embroidery hoop and started stitching. I used an embroidery stitch called the satin stitch, which is just many stitches right next to each other that fill up a whole field. And I was a little bit loose about where the stitches started and ended. I just didn't want any of them to be like too long so that they would hang off the patch. I repeated the process for several more images of my pretty kitty and uh, printed them out at all different sizes to get a variety going. And um, on the smaller ones, I found that I only needed to use like half of the strand of embroidery floss. Otherwise, the line was kind of too chunky for the overall size of the patch. At this point, it's just a regular embroidery. You could uh, stick it to a mat and frame it like this, uh, but I wanted to cut it out and turn it into a patch. So I tried a couple different edge finishing techniques. The first of which was just to do a binding stitch with the embroidery floss all the way around the edge, but that didn't work out as well as I had hoped with the fabric being a little bit flexible and it, it sort of made the edges a little roughly. So then I switched to the sewing machine and I would sew one straight line around and then a zigzag stitch and then I'd cut it and then do a zigzag stitch to capture that raw edge and that sort of seemed to work the best for me but I still wish I could have finished the whole thing by hand. Embroidered patches go great on jackets and bags and hats you know anywhere and you can pin it in place with safety pins or sew it in place permanently or even glue it. I chose to sew this one onto my jean jacket. These patches were a whole lot of fun to make and I got to spend that time sort of reminiscing about my sweet kitty and um, I think it's a great way to memorialize a dear friend. Besides the ones we're keeping in the family, uh, the rest of these patches are going to be given away to my Patreon supporters, so check out the link in the description for more info about how you can get in on that. And also check out the art print I made of all of these embroidered patches and the backs of the embroideries. I put that in my digital shop. It feels like just yesterday I was writing my first tutorials on instructables.com, but it was actually over a decade ago. And since then, I've been making more or less a project every month or week. And during that time, I've accumulated some tips for you. So here are five tips for documenting your DIY projects. Some of these tips you can find in my 2014 article about making better build videos, but these tips will be good for 
any type of documentation you're making. Tip number one, find the optimal lighting conditions for your project. That needs to take into consideration scale. Is it on the tabletop or do you need to work on it outside? Um, are there harsh shadows? Are there details that you need to be able to see? The quality of your light is much more important than the quality of your camera. Tip number two, stabilize your camera with a tripod. Nobody likes blurry photos or shaky handheld video. So whether it's a $15 tripod or the Manfrotto Magic Arm I use over the desk, just stabilize your shots. Which ties into tip number three, optimize your camera workflow for hands-free operation. That might mean you have a camera with a flip-out screen so you can see it while you're filming. Might mean you build a foot switch trigger for capturing photos with both of your hands doing something at the same time. I have a tutorial for this one. And uh, it might mean you wear the GoPro on your head, you know? It's all good. I find that when both of your hands can be in the shot, you can capture the natural action and really uh, better communicate that action through the documentation versus just stopping to take photos and video in between the steps that don't really show like the complicated stuff that, you know, you did. Tip number four, use that photo and video you just captured as reference while you're writing up the text version of your project instructions. That might mean you're making a blog post or a full-blown tutorial, but uh, those videos and photos are gonna help you remember all of the details as well as remember the pitfalls for beginners or the things you tried that you might do differently in the future. This text can also double as your voiceover or direct camera address script if you're making a video like that. And tip number five, it's to edit with multiple passes. Whether you're just doing a text write-up, text and photos, and or video, you really wanna go back over your work more than one time to make sure it's as concise and complete as possible. And then play to different mediums strength. If there's a complicated spatial relationship aspect to your project that might be best shown in a video or in a GIF made from a video clip versus like eight photos in a long text description. Whereas you might leave out a bunch of technical information that is best looked up all at once in text form anyway from your video or photos. I'll always maintain that your lighting is way more important than what camera you use, but I've gone through a bunch of different cameras over the years, and I wrote a blog post about my current favorite gear, so if you're curious, you can find all the links to those things in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I put out new videos every week about DIY projects, or in this case, a little tips video, and I hope you'll subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time. In this week's project, I'm upgrading this vintage lamp with voice control using an Amazon Echo and ESP8266 microcontroller in the Adafruit Feather Huzzah flavor. To control the AC portion of the circuit, I'm hooking up a relay feather wing. I always build a breadboard prototype of these types of circuit first, even if the ultimate goal is to get everything to fit into the wooden base of the lamp. Alexa, turn the light on. Okay. Alexa, turn the light off. Okay. The Arduino code for this project uses the example sketch for the FOMO ESP library, which emulates a Belkin Wemo device. Consequently, configuring your homebrew is exactly the same as the commercial device, which is a breeze in the Alexa app. For natural speech's sake, I've named my device The Light. I'll put a link to my instructable for this project in the description, where you can find the circuit diagram and code for this project. After confirming that everything works, it's time to tackle the woodworking portion of this project. See, the lamp is held together by this threaded rod, which is easy to shorten, and then I'm just chiseling out the wood base to accommodate my components. Here I've got an example sketch using the FOMO ESP Arduino library, and I um, have this working with my Amazon Echo, as you saw, but I want to add in that auxiliary button so that you can still turn the lamp on and off with the switch on the lamp and then independently control it with voice commands. So I want to mash this up with some button code. I'm going to look through my samples here. What I want is not the standard button, but the state change detection example and that's uh, because it shows you how to create an action that happens only when the button state changes not just about what the button state is you guys are always asking me how to get better at coding and how to practically work with the code examples for mine and other projects and that's why i'm going to show you right now how i'm mashing up these two 
programs. Uh, basically, I'll look here at the example. It has some variables in it. Now, this sketch, it lights up the button every four times you press the button with this variable called button push counter. We don't need that. We just want it to do it every time. So we can um, omit this variable, but we'll take these two, button state and last button state, and we'll put those over with our um, variables here. And then uh, we also need a a pin for the button. We already have, we're not going to use an LED, we're going to use the relay. So the the button pin is actually four. And then we got to make sure that we're initializing the button pin as an input and uh, that's going to happen in the setup function. Let's do it right here. And you know what, I happen to know that that one has an internal pull-up resistor, so I'm going to use it so I don't have to wire it on the breadboard. And then let's just copy everything but this button counter section. So it's going to read the button pin and check to see if the pin is connected to high or low, power or ground, and then it's going to say if the button state is not equal to the button state the last time around, then enter this if then statement and then evaluate whether it's high or low and turn it on and off uh, before then setting that as the last button state and continuing around the loop. Uh, okay, so we'll copy all of that. And in this example, nothing really happens in the loop except to call that FOMO function. So we'll just paste all of this in here. Button state, digital read, button pin. Okay, it's in here. We don't need to increment button push counter, but we do need to uh, when the serial print on, we do need to turn the relay on. So we'll go up here to the code that does that, which is for the voice commands, digital write, relay pin high, copy it, and put that in here. If button state equals high, then, oops, then paste that. Except, hmm, that's not exactly what we want, is it? Because um, we're using the internal pull-up resistor, so we actually the button activity is reversed. So we want um, if the button state is low, then turn the relay on. And then if it's not, uh, turn the relay off. And remember, this whole if statement is uh, none of this stuff is going to happen unless the button state has changed from the last time through the loop. So if you haven't touched the button and you activated it with the voice commands, it's not going to undo that. They actually they act kind of in parallel with one another. So over here, I have my lamp with the bottom all carved out and my hardware here. I've tidied up the AC connections a little bit with some heat shrink tubing. And um, instead of the power brick inside the bottom, I have the USB plug plugged into the computer so I can update the code. And then I'm just going to hit upload. Now we're ready to test and see if this switch works. Oh yeah, great. This is a click on, click off toggle switch. And that's why it has this hiccup at the beginning because the mechanism actually um, turns off and then back on again really quickly on its way into its latched position. And so now that this is working, I should go put it in the bedroom with the Amazon Echo and uh, test out its full functionality. Alexa, turn the light on. Okay. Alexa, turn the light on. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that project as much as I did and found something useful you could incorporate into your own connected devices. If you need a little bit more help getting started with the ESP8266, try my free Internet of Things class on Instructables.com. I'll put a link to that and the tutorial for this project in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. I put out new DIY videos every week, and it would mean so much to me if you'd subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. See you next time. Alexa, turn the light off. Okay. Thanks. Alexa, turn the light on. Okay. Alexa.
on my motorcycle was super loose and should probably be replaced. I ordered a new one, but then I found out that I should also be replacing the sprockets at the same time, so today I'm just adjusting the chain tension on my 1975 Honda CB200. I almost didn't make this video since I basically just followed the excellent instructions from a video I found on Old Bike Garage's channel. But hey, I can offer you my experience of performing this routine maintenance for the first time and a riding montage at the end of the video. And if nothing else, hopefully this will stir up some Google juice for the excellent video that taught me. I started with my bike in neutral on its center stand, with room to get to both sides of the rear axle. I didn't remove the chain guard because there was one screw in a hard to remove place. Then I removed the axle nut's cotter pin and loosened the nut itself with a 22 millimeter wrench. Next up, I loosened the lock nuts on both sides' adjuster bolts. The adjustment happens when you tighten the adjuster bolts, which then press against the frame to move the axle backwards. The single notch on the chain adjuster is its index mark, and both right and left index marks should align with consistent positions on the notch scale along the rear fork. That keeps your chain straight and your wheel aligned. It's important for them to be the same on both sides. According to my manual, the chain's free play at the tightest point should be about 20 millimeters or three quarters of an inch. What remains is the reverse order of before. Tighten the lock nuts, tighten the axle bolt, and reinsert and bend the cotter pin. I learned this adjustment can throw off the play in the rear brake pedal, so it's important to check and adjust that after adjusting the chain tension. I also took this opportunity to lubricate my chain as well. I was pleasantly surprised by how easy it was to adjust my chain tension, something I should have been doing way more often than I have been. Thanks so much for watching! I make new DIY videos every week about tech, crafts, and my life in New York City. So please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to catch the next one, and follow me on social media for a sneak peek at what's to come. This week I made some small concrete planters using old plastic containers as molds. This was my first time working with concrete, but I do have some mold making and casting experience from school. One time I made this ice bear inside a netted iceberg. First, I cut down these plastic juice bottles, which I thought had an interesting shape. Since I want water to be able to easily drain out of the planters, I glued a piece of a drinking straw to the bottom of the bottle. For my inner shell, I'm using an old film container, but you could also use an empty cosmetics bottle or whatever you have around. I glued the inner shell to the straw and some chopsticks to both shells to keep the inner shell centered. Here's one I made at a larger scale with the juice bottle as the inner shell. I had a can of mold release kicking around so I gave them all a quick spray. 
I sifted out the aggregate gravel from the concrete to create a smoother surface on the finished product. Then I mixed in some water until I got a thick mixture, but that was still pourable. I added too much water at first and had to add more concrete to get the right consistency. I tried to fill up the molds to about the same height and set them on a level surface to cure. If you have one available to you, I recommend using a vibrating palm sander without any sandpaper to vibrate the full molds. This helps get the bubbles out of the concrete. About 24 hours later, I set about removing them from the molds. This part can be a little dangerous, so just remember that the plastic can give way at any moment, driving your tool in whatever direction you're pressing it. So keep your body parts out of the way. I had an okay time with the plastic bottles, but had to resort to some power tools to open up the stiffer plastic. While the planters are still a bit wet, it's easier to shave down any sharp edges. I broke this one by squeezing the film container, so I let the pieces dry and used a bit of construction adhesive to glue them back together. All that remained was to fill up the concrete planters with succulents. I put a little gravel at the bottom, then packed the plant in with some succulent soil, which is good drainage. I topped off the planters with a little more gravel and some pretty sand. I had a great time dipping a toe into a new medium and look forward to making more concrete projects in the future. Thanks so much for watching. I make new DIY videos every week about tech, crafts, and my life in New York City. So please give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to catch the next one, and follow me on social media for a peek at what's to come.
week, I made a trivet from wine corks. It's a quick and easy project to make once you've collected enough corks, or you can buy them online or from a home brewing store. The most basic version just requires a large hose clamp and a screwdriver. Arrange the corks and tighten the screw until it holds everything in place. I used a craft knife to cut down a few corks that were longer than the rest. If you want your trivet to last more than a few uses or stand up to transportation or storage, you'll want to glue the corks together. I like to use E6000 because of its working time or how long you have to adjust the pieces before it starts to set up. It dries clear and flexible in about 24 hours. To add a personal touch, I cleaned and spray painted the hose clamp before tightening it around the corks. And then I used some embarrassingly dull sheet metal snips to trim off the end of the hose clamp. You can find a complete tutorial for this project at the link in the description with links to the materials and all that. Thanks so much for watching! If you like this project, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to catch the next one. This week I retrofitted a vintage camera with a Raspberry Pi and Pi camera. Now it takes three photos, compiles an animated GIF, and uploads it to my Tumblr. If you want to see how I made it, just keep watching! The first thing I did was to prepare the basic functions using a solderless breadboard, HDMI display, keyboard, the whole Raspi setup. I based the wiring and code for this project off the free Instructables Raspberry Pi class, which I'll put a link to in the description. One LED is programmed to turn on when the Python script starts up, and another flashes in time with the photos being taken after you press the push button. A third LED stays lit when the Pi is processing and uploading the GIF, so you know when it's okay to take another. After I finished troubleshooting the code and circuit, I moved on to build everything into my camera. Although I didn't use the original lens, I did install the push button to be triggered by the original shutter lever. I soldered the LEDs up with some resistors and heat shrink tubing, then used some hot glue to secure them in place. All the wires route back into the main body of the camera, which was big enough for the Pi once I cut out the cardboard. I plugged everything in again to test it out inside my new build, and I added a shell script to run my Python script when the Pi boots up, so I could operate it without a screen or keyboard. I also added my phone's tethering Wi-Fi network to my Pi so I could take it with me to Maker Faire. You can find a complete tutorial for this project at the Instructables link in the description, with links to the supplies I used. Thanks so much for watching! If you like this project, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to catch the next one. Hi, I'm Becky Stern, and I've been building with and teaching Arduino for more than 10 years. The most common beginner Arduino mistake is biting off more than you can chew by attempting to build a project with too many elements at once. You get frustrated and overwhelmed, and the project never gets finished. If you want to build a quadcopter, you have to break it down into simpler systems first. Those things have GPS, inertial measurement units with accelerometers and gyroscopes, not to mention variable speed motor control. You've got to honestly reflect on your abilities and then look up examples and tutorials for each component of your project and build them successfully before attempting to combine them. The second mistake I see frequently is making assumptions during prototyping. I teach the free online Arduino class at Instructables.com and also teach in person at SVA and NYC Resistor. And I know it can be really tough to remember all the different things that could possibly go wrong, whether it be your wiring or your code or your software settings. But when your circuit's not behaving the way you expect, don't just assume the wiring's right without checking. Double check the pin number you've specified in software is the same pin connected to your LED or sensor or power and ground especially. Get into a detective mindset. Hunt for missing semicolons. 
get out your multimeter. Add in some serial debugging to your code to help you figure out what's going on. The last mistake I see a lot with Arduino beginners is underutilizing the resources available to you online. The Arduino site has a reference section that breaks down the whole programming language by groups of commands with simple samples demonstrating each one. I look up stuff all the time, like how Modulo works. But there are also community resources you should be taking advantage of as well, like researching your questions in online forums and posting instructables about your projects. Just saying. I hope these tips help you achieve success in all your Arduino endeavors. You can find out more about my free class and the write-up for these tips at the links in the description below. And if you've got tips for beginners, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I put out new DIY videos every week about tech, crafts, and my life here in New York City. Give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to catch the next one, and follow me on social media for a peek at what's to come. Here's a quick tip about properly splicing cables. This is handy for changing the connector on your solar panel or simply making any two wire cable longer. This may seem like a basic skill, but I know by the time I learned this technique, I wish someone had told me earlier. Start out by cutting your wires and stripping off the outer layer of insulation. Slide a big piece of heat shrink tubing onto one side of the wire, which we'll use at the end to seal everything up. The trick here is to get the pair of connections to be the same length, but offset the solder joints. So cut and strip your wires as you see here. This has the benefit of not bulking up the cable with stacked connections, and also keeps the connections away from one another, minimizing the risk for short circuits. Don't forget the heat shrink tubing before tinning and soldering the wires together. If they don't turn out exactly the same, you can reheat the longer one to adjust. Shrink up the inner and outer layers of heat shrink tubing and enjoy. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And check out the other tutorials and projects on my channel. See you next time. Today, we're making a solar balloon that floats with the power of hot air. All you need are some black trash bags, cellophane packing tape, scissors, and some thread. I'm using one trash bag with the bottom seam intact, then these middle two I cut off both the seam and the flaps, and then this last one I cut off the seam, but not the flaps, for the opening. Open up and overlap the trash bags together by about an inch, then tape around each seam. Make sure you don't have any gaps or holes. Run around to fill your new balloon with air. Gather up and tie off the open end of the balloon, topping it off with air if you're up for it. The black color of the bag absorbs the sun's energy, causing the air inside to heat up. Then that air inside becomes less dense than the air around it, causing the balloon to float up, supporting its own weight. Tether your balloon and put it out in the sun, where it should heat up and start to float. This same physics powers hot air balloons you can ride in. It's the principle of buoyancy. Once the air inside heats up and expands, the balloon weighs less than the air it displaces. Now, it's very important not to let the balloon go. Not only is it a polluting environmental hazard if it gets away from you on the ground, but it's also very dangerous for airplanes. When you're ready to deflate it, be careful because the surface of the balloon will be hot. Put a hole and start to squeeze out the air. This project is a part of my free solar class on Instructables.com, where you can learn more about harnessing the power of the sun, from backyard projects like this one to applying solar power to your microcontroller projects. I put a link in the description. It would mean so much to me if you check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe to my channel to see more DIY projects about crafts, technology, and my life here in New York City. Hey, it's Becky Stern here. Today we're making a solar-powered USB backup battery. This simple soldering project will charge your phone or tablet. It's perfect for camping or the next time the power goes out. Let's get started. You'll need a solar battery charging board and power boost, both from Adafruit, as well as a battery, power switch, some wire, and an enclosure to put your circuit inside. I'm using an old business card box. 
test fit your components inside your enclosure and plan out where the USB port, power switch, and charging ports will go. Solder on the solar charger's capacitor and the power boost's USB port, then solder a JST pigtail wire to the power boost's input. Now that the components are solid, you can mark and cut the openings for the ports and power switch with a craft knife. If you're using a wood, plastic, or metal enclosure, you'll need different tools to cut these holes. My power switch has an LED inside it, which I chose because it's useful to see when the USB port is powered on. I added a resistor to one side of the LED as I wired up my switch. My switch has to be installed from the outside, so I did that before connecting the switch and LED to the pads on the power boost board. This is a signal switch, so it doesn't have to be rated for high current. The power boost and battery plug into the solar charger's JST ports, and after testing to be sure it powers up and charges your devices, everything gets secured inside the enclosure with double stick foam tape or screws. When the sun hits the panel, the photovoltaic cells generate an electric current, but it changes based on the season and the weather. The solar charging circuit regulates the input from the panel and charges a battery at a steady rate. If there's enough juice left over, it can power a device at the same time. The power boost takes input directly from the solar panel when it's plugged in and sunny, or from the battery at other times, and regulates it into a USB 5 volt charging port. This project is a part of my free solar class on Instructables.com, where you can find out more details on customizing this project and more fun ways to harness energy from the sun, from backyard skills to applying solar power to your microcontroller projects. I put a link in the description. It would mean so much to me if you'd check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to catch more DIY videos about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. Today, we'll be doing some solar engraving using a magnifying glass and a homemade stencil. If you want to learn how, just keep watching. You'll need a piece of glass, like from a picture frame, and some aluminum duct tape, a cutting mat, and a craft knife. Tape up the glass to make the edges safer to touch. Draw and cut a simple design of your choice from the aluminum tape. Then carefully transfer the stencil to the center of the glass and fill in the remaining glass with more metal tape. Take your new stencil, magnifying glass, and some materials with you to a bright and sunny spot where you can easily tilt your work to directly face the sun. This technique works great on leather, cork, and cardboard, and will also engrave wood with a little extra time. You should wear dark sunglasses to make it easier to see where your concentrated light beam is going and also consider some sunblock and a hat. Adjust the distance and angle of the magnifying glass until the point of light is as small as you can possibly make it, and slowly move the beam over all areas of the stencil. It's smart to be prepared with a spray bottle of water in case your material flares up while you're working. But to be ultra safe while using this technique, I've also got a fire extinguisher nearby. The concentrated beam of light coming from the magnifying glass gets really hot, so keep it away from living things. You can achieve slightly crisper lines if you place your stencil tape side down, which requires cutting your design backwards if it's not already symmetrical. So next time the sun comes out, try it out. I'd love to see what you create with this technique. This project is a part of my free solar class on Instructables.com, where you can learn more about harnessing the power of the sun, from backyard projects like this one to applying solar power to your microcontroller projects. I put a link in the description. It would mean so much to me if you check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe to my channel to see more DIY projects about crafts, technology, and my life here in New York City. Hi, it's Becky. Today we are making a solar-powered soil moisture monitor. It uses an ESP8266 Wi-Fi microcontroller running some low-power Arduino code, and everything's waterproof, so it can be left outside. Let's get started. You'll need a solar battery charging board and ESP8266 breakout, such as the Node MCU or Huzzah, as well as a soil sensor, battery, power switch, some wire, and an enclosure to put your circuit inside. 
It's important to create a solderless breadboard prototype for projects like this so you can make sure your sensor and code are working before making any permanent connections. In this case, that meant temporarily attaching solid headers to the stranded ends of the sensor wires. You can find the circuit diagram for the prototype and the final version at the link in the description, and learn more about using Arduino on the ESP8266 in my free Instructables Internet of Things class. Prepare the solar charging board by soldering on its capacitor and some wires to the load output pads. I'm customizing mine to charge at a faster rate with an optional add-on resistor and making it safer to leave unattended by replacing the surface mount resistor with a 10K thermistor attached to the battery itself. This will limit charging to a safe temperature range. Solder up the microcontroller board and power switch to a PermaProto board and connect the solar charger power output to the input of your switch, which should be rated for at least one amp. Mark and drill holes in a waterproof enclosure using a step drill and install two cable glands, or waterproof clamps basically. Insert the port side of a waterproof power cable into one and solder it to the solar charger's DC input. Insert the soil sensor through the other and connect it up to the PermaProto. Test it out before closing up the enclosure and installing the sensor in your herb garden, precious potted plant, or other soil within range of your Wi-Fi router. The program sleeps most of the time, but wakes up occasionally to read the temperature and humidity of the soil and reports it to the cloud data service Adafruit I.O. From there, it's easy to set up a recipe for email or text alerts on the API Gateway site, if this then that. This is a fun project to customize. You could switch out the sensor for something else entirely or integrate the solar power features into your other Arduino projects. This project is a part of my free solar class on instructables.com, where you can learn more about harnessing the energy of the sun, from advanced applications like this one to fun backyard activities too. I put a link in the description. It would mean so much to me if you'd check it out. Thanks so much for watching. Please subscribe for new DIY videos every week about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City. Today I want to show you this dry box I made for my 3D printer filament. It protects the PLA from absorbing moisture from the air, which can cause failed prints and nozzle clogs. The box also dispenses the filament to the 3D printer, providing convenient storage. Let's get started. You'll need a gasketed plastic container that's at least as tall and deep as a roll of filament, and as long as you want to accommodate your shelf space or filament collection. I ordered mine on Amazon, I'll put a link in the description. Besides the box, you'll need a piece of PVC pipe or closet pole to match the length of your box, some Teflon tubing to feed your filament to your printer, some silica gel packets to absorb moisture from the air inside the box, a step drill and a screw gun, some O-rings and screws, and some 3D printed parts I found on Thingiverse. The first is a closet pole socket, which I had to scale to match my pipe, and then some of these screwless filament feeders, which were a perfect fit. I wanted the box to rest on its side so I could easily remove the lid and change filament rolls without removing the whole box from the shelf. So when it came time to mark and drill the holes for the pole sockets, I tilted the mounting axis a bit towards the box opening. I put an O-ring on each screw before tightening down the bolts. I test fit a roll to find the natural unspooling level of the filament and drilled more holes to accommodate the filament feeders which also get O-rings before being tightened and fitted with a piece of Teflon tubing, which keeps dust and air off the filament on its way to the printer. Then it's time to load up the filament through the tubing. Mine then feed down behind their shelf to the printer below, but you could just as easily feed the filament up from below your printer if that's what your space allows. This is an easy project that takes less than an afternoon to complete, and then you'll reap the filament preserving benefits for countless days to come. Use it to store your most frequently used colors, and archive the rest using my colleague Paige's zip top bag method. With my new dry box and a piece of vinyl to insulate my printer from drafts, my setup is feeling vastly improved. You can find a full tutorial for this project at the link in the description, and I'd love to hear your filament storage methods in the comments. Thanks so much for watching and subscribe to my channel for new DIY videos each week about technology, crafts, and my life here in New York City.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>